Okay, so, hi everyone. The quantum computers are coming. My name's Alastair Collinson. I'm a senior software developer at Zenacor and blah, blah, blah. You've heard enough of uh, that crap today, I assume. One thing about me you should care about is this. I'm a nerd. And even though I'm a nerd, one thing I'm not, some nerds are, but me personally, I'm not, I'm not a physicist. Yet today I'm here to talk about quantum computers. And that, that, that quantum part of quantum computers, that, that does sound awfully like physics, doesn't it? And indeed it is related to quantum physics, quantum mechanics, but quantum computers are getting to a point now where you don't have to be a genius at physics to get started with them, to start programming them. Being a nerd is now quite sufficient. And I'm looking at you, sitting here, it's late in the day, you've heard quite a few interesting talks, I would assume. There are quite a few alternatives you could be listening to right now, and you're in a talk about quantum computers. You are probably also nerds. <laughs> so, good, good starting point. Let's talk about quantum computers. Quantum computers, well, two words in there. Let's start with the easier one, computer. What's a computer? Well, this is a computer. A bit older than what you're probably used to. This is a replica of the Tsuza Z3. Some people would argue the first computer there was. It was certainly the first electronic programmable, uh, programmable binary computer. And that binary part is really important. Chances are that every computer you've ever used directly or indirectly was binary in nature. And that's because that's been a very successful model so far. When we think binary, we often think ones and zeros, but that's not true, strictly speaking. What we need are two distinct states. But as far as we're concerned, that could be a green circle and a red triangle. They just have to be distinct. And modern computers use transistors to, to do this. Well, not those transistors. They look a bit more like this. Um, and the way a transistor works is that it has two inputs, and if the inputs are strong enough, there will be an output, otherwise there won't. Two distinct states. That works wonderfully for so many problems. I mean, we've come so far in the last decades using this model. The computers you have in your pockets, called smartphones, are so powerful nowadays. You can do so many things, but there are some limits. And there are limits we're trying to chip away, but a few of them are really hard. And one area where we have a lot of problems, and now for the nerds in the room, please don't be shocked. I'm going to talk about nature. Nature has loads and loads of really, really hard problems for computers. Now just looking at this uh, one image, where in the image do we have forest area? Zoom in a bit to make life easier. So this is certainly forest area, and this part certainly isn't. But what about that area? I mean, there are a few trees there, obviously, but most of it is grass. So is it a forest? Basically, we have to come in and decide this is the rule. If there are, for example, so and so many trees per square kilometer, it counts as a forest, otherwise it doesn't. Something of the kind. We have to draw an arbitrary line. And when we have to draw a line, that means we're losing information that could, at some point, be valuable. So this is something regular classical computers struggle with, because they have to have these lines that we have to draw, or we have to teach them to draw. So that's the computers. Let's get to the other part, the quantum part. Quantum mechanics was established in the 1920s by Niels Bohr and Carl Werner, Heitz, uh, Carl Werner Heisenberg, that's his name. And they worked together in Copenhagen. 
What they came up with were both the basics for quantum mechanics and an interpretation of quantum mechanics which became known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics after the city where they came up with it. And I'm going to go through a really, really simple explanation of how this, in, uh, this Copenhagen interpretation works. If there are any physicists in the room, I know this is an oversimplification. Please don't hit me. But let's start with an atom. And we'll just assume this is a radioactive atom. We don't actually care about the whole atom. What we care about is the nucleus. And radioactivity means that at some point, part of that nucleus will split off into um, radiation. This is radioactive decay. So if we have one of these atoms and we wait for a while, there are two possible states that we think we could be measuring. Either, well, nothing happened or it decayed. Right? Those are the two possible states it could be in after a while. According to the Copenhagen interpretation, however, we can have both of those states at the same time, which is weird. And we can have those at the same time just as long as nobody measures it. And then when uh, it's measured, the state is determined. Now, I've, uh, I've visualized measuring the state as a pair of eyes. Please don't confuse this with consciousness. Consciousness has nothing to do with quantum physics. Quantum physics could exist completely fine without any humans in the universe. Um, it just needs something to require our system to have a definite state. But nevertheless, weird, right? And we aren't, of course, the first people to think that this is weird. One of the first who made himself heard about it was Schrodinger here. So Schrodinger came up with a thought experiment that displayed why he thought this was such a weird thing. And that's, of course, the famous thought experiment of Schrodinger's cat. OK, so let's walk through Schrodinger's cat really quickly. In this thought experiment, we have, obviously, the cat. This cat is in a box. And we also have a few other things in the box. Namely, first of all, a radioactive isotope. Now, this is very close to what we saw in the short explanation earlier with our radioactive atom. There are just many of them. And this isotope is chosen in such a way that it has a... Um, that, that the chance that after one hour has passed, any radioactive decay will be measured at all is 50-50. Okay, so... We have that isotope. We also have a bottle of gaseous cyanide. Now, cyanide obviously is very, very poisonous. And if that were to escape, that would be bad. As long as it's in the bottle, we're fine. But then there's one last thing in that box, and that's this weird contraption. This is a Geiger counter with a hammer attached to it. And if the Geiger counter were to register any radiation from the isotope, this would happen. Yeah, not nice. So, we wait for an hour, and there are two things we may measure could have happened if we open the box. Either the isotope is fine, and therefore so is the cat, or a uh, dead cat. But according to what we just learned about, um, about quantum mechanics, we can have both of those states at the same time, and they overlap. How, how can that work? How can anything be dead and alive at the same time? <laughs> I don't think Schrodinger was thinking zombie cats here, but it's certainly weird to think of something being dead and alive at the same time. Now, Schrodinger did actually believe that quantum mechanics was real. He just thought that the interpretation um, that had been uh, publicized was, well, wrong and nonsense. So he came up with his own interpretation, which he called the many worlds theory. 
Now, before I get into the many worlds theory, I have a small disclaimer. For us, the many worlds theory is a model. And as scientific models go, they can be wrong in many, many ways, just as long as they're wrong in ways that we don't care about. As long as they're right enough, that's fine for us. And with the many worlds theory, many physicists nowadays believe that it is wrong, but it's still right enough to be useful to us now, whether or not it actually is correct. So how does it work? Well, first of all, you have to take everything, the universe, and this is a picture of a galaxy, I know. I couldn't find a picture of the universe. Just, just uh, stay with me here. So in this universe, we have, among other things, our cat. And now one of these radioactive uh, events happens. And what happens then is not that we get our Schrodinger's zombie cat, but rather, and this is Wonderful, uh, a wonderful example of how physicists come up with really simple solutions, the universe copies itself. And these are carbon copies with one small exception. That's the result of that quantum event. So those universes are exactly equal, except that in one universe the cat is alive and in the other it's dead. Okay, and now this can happen again and you get four universes with cats in various states, and it can happen again, of course. You know, you, you get the gist. One thing you may have realized here is that we have rather many dead cats in this slide. And now that's due to a little thing I like to call biology, because in our universe, and probably in all of the other universes I just showed, if you have a dead cat and add more poisons, you do not get a live cat, sadly. Luckily, however, cats and quantum computers are different in that aspect. Well, not with poison, but you can reverse that thing. So um, we're fi we finally arrived at quantum computers, and this here is a representation of a quantum bit, or qubit for short. This representation is called a Bloch sphere. And it nicely visualizes the state a qubit can be in. So let's start with simple stuff. A qubit can have a state of zero, which means it points right up. It can have a state of one, which might, means it points right down. Oops, there we go. And it can have something that's neither 0 nor 1, which is somewhere in, in there on the sphere, but different. So here already we have a difference to our classical bits. Classical bits can have what we represent often as 0 and 1, but that's it. And here we have further states. And obviously not just one further state. We have a whole bunch of other possible states our qubit can be in. Now, to operate on a qubit, we need so-called quantum gates. And I want to show you a few quantum gates today. The first one is the so-called Hadamard gate. So the Hadamard gate is relatively simple to understand, but very powerful in its effect. Basically, it imagines an axis halfway between the x and the z axis, then spins our vector around that axis. Uh, axis. Now, if we were to measure our qubit at this point, we would get 0 or 1 with 50% probability each. If we were to repeat it many, many times, the, uh, the measurements would come close to 50-50. And since it's probability just close, it would be exact, probably, but it gets really close. Now, if our vector were to point further up or further down, those probabilities would change. This is quantum superposition. This is being in two states at the same time. As soon as we check, it has to decide, is it in state A or state B? Is it 0 or 1? But as long as we don't measure it, it's in several states. Much simpler 
would be the X gate. Now, the X gate is one of three so-called Pauli gates. And basically, this takes the axis it's named after, the X axis, and spins our vector around that. So this, in its effect, may seem pretty familiar to you. This is basically a NOT gate at least in the way we're using it right now. Because if you have zero and apply an X gate, you get one and vice versa. And this is relatively boring, but you can get a more exciting version of it called the conditional not gate or C not. And this is our, a two qubits gate. So we have, um, first of all, we have a, a, a measured gate a source gate, you could say, and we have a target gate. And if we apply the C0 here, in this case, nothing more, much happens. The source gate is at zero, which means the condition isn't met, and that's fine. If our source gate is at one, and we apply our C0, then the other qubit will flip. So far, OK. This is an if-then-else, right? Except what happens when our source gate is in this kind of state? If we apply our C0 now, we get something a bit like this. We have two arrows there. Which means that this is some kind of weird state. Actually, it's, it's a bit closer to this we have either both qubits in the zero state or both in the one state. But they're always identical. If I had flipped one of the gates earlier, it would have been uh, vice versa. Well, if I had flipped the target gate, it would be opposite, but always opposite. This is basically what we had with our radioactive isotope and Schrodinger's cat. This is quantum entanglement. Those two gates are now linked. And the results you get when measuring them are dependent on each other. Now, they stay in this super, um, superimposed state as long as nobody measures. So this is kind of like a lazy operation. It doesn't actually decide is it 0 or 1 until you apply your measurement. Now, I've shown you the Hadamard gate and the CNOT gate. I've shown you one of the three Pauli gates. The other two are basically the same. They just spin around different axes. I haven't shown you the identity gate, which is extremely boring because it takes a qubit and leaves it as it is. I guess you need that for mathematical completeness. Um, there are phase gates, which I haven't shown you. They do exciting things, but we're not going to get to those today. And um, they can be called S and T with or without daggers. They can be called differently. Syntax differs there. And there are many, many other gates that you could imagine and use. But what do you use them for? What are use cases for, well, not just quantum gates, quantum computers generally? Because a quantum computer is basically a bunch of quantum bits that you use together. And there are a number of things you can do with a quantum computer. Some, in some cases, just in theory right now, some of those are practical uh, even today. So one thing, if you've heard anything about quantum computers, you've probably heard that they endanger e encryption. And that's because there's, um, there's an algorithm called Shor's algorithm, which is really, really good at factorizing numbers. Now, many modern encryption algorithms are based on the fact that factorizing huge numbers is a really difficult problem. Not so much with a quantum computer. So that's going to be a problem. There are quantum safe uh, encryption algorithms, mind you. So not everything is lost. But the most popular algorithms used today are in, da uh, in danger from quantum computers. Other than that, uh, quantum computers can used for, be used for engineering tasks. Volkswagen and Google are working on uh, using quantum computers. This is actually an article about how Volkswagen used them to increase uh, uh, their battery capacity for electric cars. NASA is using uh, um, quantum computers for engineering tasks, early ones, but 
nevertheless. Um, you can simulate chemical systems with quantum computers. You can use quantum computers for AI applications, which is probably the closest to, of the use cases to many of you here um, that I'm, I'm going to show. You can use quantum computers for weather prediction, potentially. I mean, weather is notoriously hard to predict because the, uh, the systems are so complex. But quantum computers are rather good with complex systems. Talking about complex systems, quantum computers are also potentially useful for detecting financial fraud. I mean, if you think weather conditions are complex, try to understand humans. Um, <laughs> but potentially, that would be something that can be done with quantum computers at some point, probably in the near future. And Bitcoin. Now, this actually comes back to the first example I gave, because Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. That crypto part, encryption, I mean, for the moment, you're as safe as you're going to get with Bitcoin. But as soon as quantum computers are powerful enough to get working on Bitcoin, they are going down and not coming up again. So, yeah, as I said, for the moment, you're as safe as you'll get with Bitcoin, but uh, that'll change. And actually, there's one further use case I want to show you. Um, this is an article which was published yesterday evening. Don't say I don't keep you up to date. And basically, uh, James Weaver, someone else who goes around conferences and talks about quantum computers, has built a music generation program based on quantum computers, which is uh, probably really cool. I haven't checked it out much more than reading this article, but it looks very interesting. But what about you? I mean, I'm standing here telling you about how quantum computers work and what they could do. I'm hoping that uh, I can get a few of you, at least, to look into quantum computers, because most people who are working on quantum computers today are from academic backgrounds, and they work in the sciences. And that's, those are great people doing great work, but they have different kinds of problems than people like us. I assume most of you work in the industrial sector um, have. We just have different use cases, and so we have to bring our problems and our ideas into this world to make them useful to us. Why should you care? Well, one thing is job security is always a good thing. Uh, about a month ago, just over a month ago actually now, um, the first quantum computing job fair was held in uh, Bristol in the UK, but probably more immediate would be this here. Um, Venkat is another speaker, and he's not the first one to say this, but I think he put it quite nicely. When you learn something, try to learn something that's different from what you know in as many ways as possible, because it will help you think differently and give you a broader perspective. And that can be useful in so many, uh, so many ways. And believe me, quantum computing is so different from what you've done so far. Um, this will this will enlighten you. Okay, so let's say you believe me, you think, fine, this is interesting, what can I do? There are a few offers that you can use today. You can uh, leave the talk up, preferably after I've finished, and start working on quantum computers immediately. For example, using the IBM Quantum Experience. So the IBM Quantum Experience is basically quantum computers in the cloud. IBM has built several quantum computers by now. And the quantum computer in this picture is actually inside here. The computer itself looks pretty much like this. This is a seven qubit quantum computer. And the big box you saw around that sir, just now in the picture is a cryostat, basically a huge freezer. because. This quantum computer, as many that you have um, available today, is based on uh, a superconducting technology, which means it has to be cooled down really, really low. I mean, these things operate at millikelvins. That's colder than it is in outer space. 
So it, it does cost a fair amount of energy, which is uh, which means it's great that IBM is paying that electricity bill for us. And you can access not that particular quantum computer, but other ones via the quantum experience, which is this web interface. And once you register, there are great tutorials on there, by the way, but once you register, you'll spend a lot of your time in this interface. This is called the Quantum Composer. So at the top, we have some information about the quantum computers available to you at that time. Um, as you can see, uh, when I took this screenshot, one of them was in maintenance. That ha happens ever so often. Luckily, there are two available, both of them five qubit quantum computers. More importantly, down here, we have the quantum score, named so because it looks like a musical score. but. It isn't for music, this is for quantum algorithms. Each of those black lines represents a qubit. And here to the side, we have our quantum gates. Among other gates, we have those that I showed you earlier. The H there is the Hadamard gate, the X is the X gate, and that blue circle with a plus sign in it, that's the C naught. Let's build something. And since we've already seen one algorithm, though it's a very simple one, let's build Schrodinger's cat in the quantum computer. So we obviously need the cat, and we need the isotope, and we need the, uh, the Geiger counter, and we need the poison. And all of those have to be linked up sequentially. So let's put those into our quantum computer, into the quantum experience. And um, the isotope is in superposition. We already saw gates to do that. That's the Hadamard gate. And all of the other gates are basically just linked up to have the same state. So those are C naughts. And looking into the box means using this pink gate here, the measurement gate. Actually, let's not just measure the state of the cat. Let's measure all of those qubits we've, uh, we've operated on just to see what the result is. And you can run this on, I repeat, a real quantum computer that IBM is running. And the result will look something like this. Now, this is the result of me running that algorithm on the quantum computer. And how does this make any sense? Well, up here we have the state where nothing happened. At the bottom there you see a bunch of zeros. That means everything's in the base state, which is zero, nothing happened, wonderful. And about 30% of the experiments got that result. Back here, we have the opposite case, where everything happened. The isotope decayed, blah, 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 the cat's dead. And you can ignore that first zero in the line. That's the qubit we didn't, uh, we didn't modify at all. And that, too, is at about 30%. But we also have a bunch of other results here. Oops. Those are errors. The problem is we are very early in, the, um, in terms of actually building quantum computers. And mistakes happen quite frequently. Now, if we had only measured the cat, we would be much closer to the results we would expect. Here, we realize that many more errors happened during the uh, the operation. And there are a bunch of reasons why these errors happen and why certain errors happen more commonly than others. In part, they have to do with physics. In part, they have to do with the architecture of the chip and so on. Um, for the moment, you have to remember that these computers are still error prone. And for this reason, quantum error correction is a huge topic, which many, many really intelligent people are working on and trying to figure out how to get these quantum computers to lower error rates. And they are having success doing that. Things are going to get better. It'll just take a bit of time. OK, so that's the quantum experience. Let's continue with the next, uh, the next project you can start using right now, and that's the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit. So this is going to be much closer to code that you are used to than what we just saw. Um, Microsoft published the Quantum Development Kit originally uh, late last year, and then uh, in, 
in spring this year, they published it for Linux and Mac OS, which they hadn't done originally. So it's available to all of you, no matter what, um, what, what operating system, at least of the big three, you're using. And this here is an example in Q Sharp, which is the quantum programming language they supply. Uh, most of it is blurred out. That's not your eyes. So, OK, what does it do? Basically, here we have a header mart to our isotope. And then we have a C0 from the isotope to the Geiger counter, from the Geiger counter to the poison, and from the poison to the cat. Pretty, uh, pretty close to what we've seen previously, just in text form. What else? Well, up here we have a mutable, mutable variable which tells us whether the cat's alive or not. Um, by default, variables, or values, I should say, in Q sharp are immutable. You have to mark them as mutable explicitly. But this, this is regular programming now. This is nothing to do with quantum, really. We have a field. We, we know fields. And here we basically just look into the box and then set our field de uh, dependent on that and just return what our result was. Did the cat survive or not? Other than that, we have a bit more st stuff to get it working. So we have to define that we need four qubits for this algorithm. We have to, well, we don't necessarily have to give uh, the qubits names, but I mean, it, best practice in any kind of programming is to use names that actually help you understand what they mean. I mean we could call them qubit 0 through qubit 3, but uh, who's going to understand that? And now we have to initialize all of those qubits to 0. The IBM Quantum Experience did this for us. Q Sharp makes us do this explicitly. And we even have to clean up after ourselves, set them all back to zero in the end. Those are limitations that Microsoft decided to put into the language. And there are good reasons uh, for them to do it. Basically, as I said, IBM is just doing it for us. We don't have to worry about it. But we can't expect everyone to be that, that kind, I guess you could call it. Maybe you don't even want it to happen. Maybe you do want random values in there. So, OK, we have to do some cleanup. And now, this is Microsoft. So obviously, it's somehow integrated into the .NET stack. And in fact, this here is a C-sharp program where we say, OK, run this on a quantum computer simulator. Actually, run the experiment. So cats run means take our Q-sharp code and run it with whatever I'm giving you. And this ha just basically has to uh, fit an interface. This could be a real quantum computer behind it. Microsoft doesn't supply that, though there is uh, at least one project which is attempting to uh, um, connect the IBM quantum experience to here. I'm not sure what the state of that project is. It might be fully functional. I haven't tried it out yet. And then we have our result and can operate it on it as with any other results from any other programming language we're used to. So here we have a wonderful combination of classical programming and quantum programming. Microsoft isn't the only company to go that way. There's also a startup, a quantum startup called Rigetti, because of course there are quantum startups. And Rigetti Forest is a product they offer, again, online. Again, for free, you can register on their website. And basically, they offer two things. First of all, is they offer, well, no, they offer three things. First of all, they offer a language they call Quill, which is a language for describing quantum algorithms. And this is our algorithm in Quill. And to go through it really quickly, we put our isotope in superposition, we connect it to the Geiger counter, we connect that to the poison, we connect that to the cat, and then we measure all of them. Wonderful. And you can read this in by part two, which is a Python SDK. Alternatively, you can write all of this directly in Python. Um, 
And so this here is the algorithm we just saw written directly in the Python uh, language they're offering, or the, the, the Python, uh, using the Python functions they're offering. It looks nearly identical to the Quill code we just saw. You can go either way. And then this can be run on number three, the quantum computer that Rigetti is offering. I think currently they're offering an eight qubit quantum computer. They were offering a 19 qubit quantum computer, but that was too error prone in their opinion, so they switched that one off. Larger computers will be coming um, just as soon as get, they get them run in to their uh, satisfaction. Rigetti isn't the only one going the Python route. Actually, IBM also has a Python SDK for the quantum experience, which they call Qiskit. And last week, they published something called Qiskit Alpha, uh, Qiskit Aqua, sorry. So Qiskit is basically the Python SDK, and that's been out for ages. Uh, I think at least a year and a half, which in the quantum computing area is ages. Um, and this works similarly to, uh, to Rigetti Forest. It's different, obviously, different maker, different ideas behind it, but the idea is basically the same. But then, as I said last week, they published Aqua, which is a library for Qiskit. And you can get this, again, totally for free. And the idea behind this is that it allows you to run quantum code without having to have as much quantum computing knowledge as, uh, for example, writing it directly in Qiskit would require. So they come with, um, with parts of the library with algorithms designed for chemical, um, chemical calculations, specifically um, quantum chemical calculations are, uh, are a big feature here. There are algorithms in there that work with AI, which may help you write interesting, smart algorithms yourself, hopefully more, more kinds than HAL here. Um, one example that they give in their tutorials is a categorization problem that they solve with, uh, uh, with Qiskit Aqua. And they also offer algorithms to use for optimization problems. So for example, there's uh, in the tutorial a case where they solve the partition problem, where you have a set of numbers you want to split into two distinct and balanced sets of numbers. And they use, um, they use a quantum algorithm to do that, namely Grover's search algorithm, if you want to Google it. Now, in all three cases, you still have to have a lot of domain knowledge. You have to know what you're programming. I looked into the chemistry algorithms, and I was quickly lost because I have a very, very limited understanding of what they were doing chemistry-wise. But you don't have to have such a large understanding of the quantum programming aspect for those algorithms. However, there are still a very, very limited number of quantum algorithms in that library. So we still need people to actually know quantum computing uh, to, get, uh, to, to continue in that field. Now, one thing you may be asking yourselves is, I mentioned quantum simulators. I mean, Q Sharp there, or the, the Microsoft Quantum Development Kit, was using a simulator. And actually, so can the uh, IBM Quantum Experience. So why don't we just use simulators for all of this? Why do we have to build real quantum computers? Because, as you can imagine, that's a really, really hard task. And a quantum simulator wouldn't have those error rates I showed you earlier. It can just calculate the stuff perfectly. And to address that issue, I'd like to go back to a previous slide. So remember this slide? In theory, when I press this button here, there should be a smooth transition of the dead cats to the gravestones, right? Let's press the button. Yeah. Would anyone argue that that was smooth? My computer is struggling with PowerPoint. This here, as soon as the slide actually switches, 
Uh, there we go. This is Google's Bristlecone quantum computer, the largest quantum computer at least known to the public to date. It has 72 qubits. By the way, when I say largest quantum computer, I am not counting the D-Wave quantum computers. If you've heard of D-Wave, um, their newest quantum computer they offer, uh, they say has 2,000 qubits, which is obviously larger than 72. Different kind of quantum computer, different kind of qubits. Um, so they are out of, uh, out of the game for this, uh, for this kind of talk. But So 72 qubits, what would you have to do to simulate that kind of stuff? And just over a month ago, Alibaba, the Chinese internet giant, published a paper where they did, among other things, just that. They simulated large quantum computers. And Google's would fit roughly here. Now, what did they need? They used 131,072 processors and a petabyte of memory to do that. Those numbers are hard to imagine, so let me help you a bit. 131,072 processors, they have roughly those sizes, if I got the right uh, processors, that is. The paper's not too specific about what they were using. But those are certainly ones used in the Alibaba cloud, which they used to simulate uh, the quantum computers. And if you take the long sides and add all of them up, lay them uh, side by side, that gives you about 10 kilometers of processors. Now, considering that walking speeds are between 4 and 7 kilometers in many estimates, averaging that out means you would need to walk for about two hours to walk past the CPUs they use to simulate those quantum computers. And the memory, so that was one petabyte of memory which means 1,000 terabytes. That's a million gigabytes. That's 10 to the 15 bytes. One paper I found said that a hum an average human body contains 3.72 uh, times 10 to the 13 cells. So you wouldn't need to count the cells in one person or even in two people you'd need about 27 people and count all of their bodily cells, and then you'd be, well, it was slightly over 10 to the 15, but that's a lot of memory they need. So, we need real quantum computers. We need people to work on those quantum computers. We need people to design algorithms for those quantum computers. And if you want to be one of those people designing algorithms for quantum computers or just playing around with them, seeing whether you can uh, build the next quantum music generator or, or whatever your idea is, there are a few different ways to do that. First of all, you can use the quantum, div uh, the, the quantum experience, which is available for free. I'll be tweeting out all of these slides probably tomorrow morning so you don't necessarily have to write down the URLs. Um, so, the quantum experience, or you can start again for free with Qiskit, which uses the quantum experience, uh, or at least it uses the same backend. Actually, you have one further quantum computer available if you use this compared to the quantum experience, and that's a 16 qubit quantum computer. Um, and of course, if you use Aqua, you have all of those algorithms which are already designed for you and a number of tutorials to help you get started. The Microsoft Quantum Development Kit, again, available for free for all of the major operating systems. Trigetti Forest, you can register for free, use that in your Python code. And if all of that is just a little too, uh, too large a leap, maybe you want to start with something more fun, like a game. Hello Quantum is a game that's, uh, that was written in Python using Qiskit. And um, when you play it, it looks a bit like this. And it's available um, via this URL. This, that'll lead you to an online interpreter where it's running. That also has a link to the GitHub gist where you can download it. These screenshots are from me running it locally. 
it works out wonderfully. Maybe the art here is a bit too primitive for you, though. I mean, ASCII art isn't that pretty. And if you have an iOS um, device, then you can also use the iOS app that, uh, uh, that the same people developed. And that's available, again, for free in the App Store. There is an Android version coming. I'm not quite sure how far along that is. But the iOS version is available right now. If you have any questions about any of those systems, of course you can ask me, and I'll try to help you. But a, a good way to do it is also to go to the Quantum Stack Exchange. Literally, Stack Overflow for quantum computers. Also, obviously, totally free, and a very, very useful resource if you have any kind of problems and if you have any kind of questions. So, to wrap up, test it out. Play around with quantum computers. It's not exactly easy often, but it's a lot of fun. It's really exciting, and there are loads of people willing to help you get started. So, that's all I've got. Time for questions. Yes? What are the uh, impacts of quantum computers on the theories of, quant uh, of um, <laughs> computation? Well, th part of them will, be have, will have to be uh, adapted. Um, for example, if you uh, speak about O notation, which is used in the academic area, uh, area that is based on Turing machines. A quantum computer is not a Turing machine. So you can't simply say the runtime of my quantum computer algorithm is O of whatever. It doesn't really work like that. I'm not quite sure. Probably someone has come up with an alternative um, which is either specific to quantum computers or which encapsulates both quantum and classical computers. I haven't seen it so far, but that doesn't mean it's not around. Um, things are moving very quickly, and there's so much to read you couldn't possibly get through it as just one person. Um, other than that, everything that exists for classical computers is still valid. It'll just be um, updated to also talk about quantum computers, if relevant in those cases. So, like, for example, the factorization of five numbers. Yes. Um, will <laughs> factorization of numbers still be NP-hard on quantum computers? Well, again, the notion of NP-hardness is dependent on algorithms for classical computers and is based on Turing machines. Um, so, difficult to answer. I'm not sure what the runtime of Shaw's algorithm is um, if you just count the number of steps required. I don't think that it will, uh, it will disturb the P versus NP problem, for example. Some problems will get a lot faster. Um, I, as I said, I'm not sure what the factorization runtime is. With Grover's algorithm, which I mentioned briefly earlier, um, I, I can give you a, a few numbers. So Grover's algorithm is an algorithm for unstructured search. So you have a set of elements, you know nothing about how they are sorted. So if you want to find one specific element in there, classically you would just have to look at every single one, which means you have O of n steps. And with a quantum computer using Grover's algorithm, you can find that, uh, uh, that element in square root of n steps at maximum. Now that that is a big difference for huge data sets. Um, but it is only a, a polynomial increase in that case. So whether or not uh, things look much better for other problems, it depends on the problem. Um, some problems you can solve much more efficiently with quantum computers. Others, there's no point. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I have a hard time understanding how it works. You gave some sort of examples here of what kind of problems it solves, quantum computing, but is other some keywords, for instance, I understood like if it was an experiment that were run, as I saw the history, so experiments that were run randomly, and then you get an histogram. 
I, I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I mean, what I understood is, um, and you can correct me if I'm misunderstanding. Um, in the example I showed, uh, I ran the experiment, I think it was 1,000 times or 1,024 times or something like that. And what we got was this, uh, this histogram at the end, which contained the results. And that's certainly one way to go. But is that the only uh, way you would operate? Is that the question? Okay, okay. What kind of problems uh, would quantum computers solve? Um, well, one good hint would be that many problems that uh, nowadays you would try to solve more efficiently using heuristics are problems that probably a quantum computer could help with. Um, so that, that's one point. Also, um, stuff that... Well, algorithms that have to do something akin to a breadth search, for example, where you have to look in many different directions and find the best one. Navigation problems, maybe. Um, those can also potentially be solved in a efficient way, in a possibly more efficient way, using quantum computers. And there are probably a bunch of other classes of problems that... I either can't think of or I may not even have seen so far, but they could also be uh, attacked through quantum computer algorithms more efficiently than uh, with classical algorithms. Or probably, realistically speaking, using a mixture of quantum and classical algorithms. I don't think there's going to be pure, um, many pure use cases for, one, uh, well, for, for quantum computers. They'll always be mixed with, uh, with classical computers. Um, well, well, kind of. Um, it can only operate. It can only perform one operation at the same time. But the effect of that operation can encompass more than uh, a classical computer can. So, um, if you look back at the sphere, I'll see if I can find. Well, my mouse for one thing. There is a mouse. Um, if we look back at the Bloch sphere, and I'll try to find the image. Uh, there we go. No, I've lost it. There. So, uh, the Bloch sphere. We have our vector pointing in one direction here, and that can mean many things. If you say, for example, each of the uh, of the axes of the axes the value means one certain piece of information, then you can easily encode three pieces of information in there. And of course, you can, in theory, encode much more than just uh, three pieces if you choose to by uh, increasing the meaning of the various axes. Now, if your algorithm is designed correctly, you can use um, multiple pieces of information per qubit as long as that information is properly linked, logically, in part, as part of the problem, linked, you can operate on that data without having to do multiple operations, which you would with a classical computer. Does that make sense? You're welcome. Any other questions? Yes. Um, what size of quantum computer is needed to beat a classical computer for factorization? Um, I think, well, I, I would have to look at Shaw's algorithm in more detail than I have so far to give you a, um, a really useful answer. Uh, for small numbers, probably what we have available now should be faster at least if you leave out stuff like waiting time. Because if you use, for example, uh, the IBM quantum computers, you have, of course, the network connection. And then they have a system where you have to wait for a certain amount of time before you get your answer. Because basically, everyone's using the same quantum computers, and they have some time sharing in there and so on. 
Um, the pure calculation time, I would assume, for small uh, numbers is already faster than what you get with classical computers. Though I haven't tried to measure that or anything. What, what for numbers like what's uh, well, what kind of numbers can you, uh, uh, can you write with f five bits? <laughs> We're talking about very small numbers here. But um, I'm pretty sure that, sir, uh, this will change quite rapidly. I think for most interesting problems, actually, for quantum computers to be useful, we have to be in the area of probably thousands of qubits. Things are moving relatively quickly. Um, in, in January, IBM announced what was then the largest quantum computer, which had 50 qubits. Three months later, Google announced Bristlecone with 72 qubits. There hasn't been an announcement in the last three months, so probably one is due relatively soon. Um, but th things are growing quite rapidly. And I mean, just uh, two years ago, we were at maybe 20 qubits. I do think that within the next couple of years, we will have that kind of power. We'll, we will have thousands of qubits available, assuming we don't hit uh, a block which we can't overcome, but so far it looks pretty good. And I would say that probably within the next five years or so, we'll have the first commercial applications of quantum computers, though there'll probably still be something like you know, quantum computer as a service, before we actually have on-premise quantum computers that'll probably take a little longer, though there are many use cases where that would be useful. Okay, then that's it. Thank you very much. And there we go.